God. Um, and this second message is about change. It's about change. An encounter with God brings change to somebody's life. Uh, and we're going to be um, um, talking about it base, base, uh, a starting point is uh, what um, in the book of Acts, the apostle Peter shared with the people that realized by their message that they missed Jesus, that they missed the Messiah. And um, they didn't know what to do. And um, on verse 37, talks about uh, their reaction to the message of Peter about Jesus dying for us and going back to heaven. It says, when the people heard these, they were caught to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. See, if you know the story, or I'm sorry, the history of the church, uh, you're going to figure that that was kind of the day of the kickoff of the church in the New Testament. Uh, because the previous chapter, Jesus just gave the last instructions to his disciples and told them to become their, his witnesses, right? And, uh, but they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on them and... Uh, and they did, and that day was uh, the day that the party, the feast of the Pentecost was celebrated. That was celebrated 50 days after the, the Passover. And uh, so they did uh, uh, receive the Holy Spirit and started preaching, and Peter took the leadership there and passed the message. They got out to the streets and spoke to the people in Jerusalem. And so, from then on, the disciples became the church for the uh, population. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So now, the disciples became the stewards of God's work among men to help them to have the experience of an encounter with God. And in verse 38, Peter gives uh, uh, an answer about the opportunity that God gave the people and told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, as I mentioned, <clears throat> in this case, we're going to focus on change. An encounter with God brings change. And we need to understand that as a consequence of, of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis, the experience of an encounter with God materializes in the framework of repentance. Repentance. When the people learned who Jesus was and his redemptive work, the Bible says that they were deeply moved, or uh, there is this expression, cut to the heart, but still puzzled and asked the disciples, brothers, what should we do? And Peter's response was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the word repent, the word repent means, um, means change of heart, 
is the change of one's mind or purpose when you go to the word specifically and it is used to say I repent it is used to uh, 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 to uh, mean, meaning a change of mind or also it is referred as a change in the inner man particularly with reference to acceptance to the will of God that is repentance Repentance and uh, following the strong concordance, that is what the, the definition that I just brought to you, the, 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 the strong concordance gives us at least three things that I, uh, that, that, that I would like to um, consider to um, have a more clear picture of repentance. And number one, it says, is to change one's mind. And it's to feel sorry that one has done this or that or having offended someone. Um, Jesus used that in Luke chapter um, 17 and verse 3. He said, t talking to his disciples and training them, he says, watch, watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent forgive them. So you see, uh, it's talking about if they change their mind, if they recognize the mistake and want to correct it, that is repentance. Um, also, <clears throat> uh, strong give us uh, a definition uh, or, or a, a, uh, give us an extension of the definition saying that you, repentance is, is about something or on account of something, used especially of those who conscious of their sins and with manifest tokens of sorrow are intent on obtaining God's pardon. So there, there is this issue that impacts our life in a way that we realize our wrongdoing and and when we agree with that then uh, that occurs repentance like a second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 21 <clears throat> Paul was talking to this church and he had some conflicts in within himself about what was going on among them because uh, um, Repentance, you know, I, I, I have heard some people talking about, you know, like, well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and just one minute before I die, I'm going to say, oh, God, forgive me. And that's going to be it, <clears throat> right? And uh, so that reveals how, how little we understand the concept of repentance, because repentance really... Uh, affect your life uh, in a more uh, definitive way. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. You see, when, when there is repentance, there are issues from which you can figure that you are repentant. There are the issues that are wrong that if we follow, we are going to know if we are repenting or not. Uh, you know, there is uh, <clears throat> this situation um, that I have heard many people that they come, they do something wrong to you or to another person, and uh, the way they want to solve it is that because they feel some pressure, maybe because of the church or whatever, or whatever, or maybe the mother, or they come and say, well, if I did any wrong against you, Forgive me. And that means 
I'm not recognizing the wrongdoing that I did because I'm not aiming on the point that it was. Do you understand? They, they come with this up in the air, okay, if I offended you in any way, like I don't know, and to me it means I didn't do it, but you are the one who's making a fuss out of it. But no, when there is repentance, there is a recognition of the issue of the offense. And, uh, and, and that's, that's uh, strong says, and the, the, the third thing that I got from strong is to change one's mind for the better. And, and that is change for the better. Hardly to a man with abhorrence of one's past sins. I don't use that word, abhorrence. I don't know if that's an old word of English or what. You can correct me with that. But what it means is that the wrong that you did, that you know, now you hate. Not the person. I mean the wrongdoing, the, the wrong attitude, the, the, that thing that offended God or offended somebody else. Now, if I repented, I, I should hate that situation. I should reject that situation. I should not be comfortable with that situation when the, the Lord Jesus or also, uh, what's his name, uh, John the Baptist came preaching about the kingdom of God, they would say, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. When there is repentance, there is a change of what I think. Now, I hate that what I did wrong. For that reason, now I'm going to go for the better place or the better attitude or the better situation, uh, keeping with repentance. Repentance. W we can uh, try to figure it out. I think it's because more is that we think we want to avoid the confrontation, we want to avoid the issue, and we want to avoid uh, the cause of change in us that we act like we don't understand. But repentance was a very familiar concept to them. And therefore, the call was easily understood. <clears throat> Another thing that helps us align our criteria with the original is to see the context in which the word was used. And, and, and there is a lot that we can come up, but I, I didn't bring a, a, here a, a compendium about uh, repentance. But, but just, just looking at a few of them, uh, Matthew 3 says that in the days that John the Baptist came preaching. So when they were preaching the word of God, when they were calling the people toward God, <clears throat> John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent it's in the context of the preaching of the gospel when we are receiving the good news about God, when we are being called to turn from our wicked ways to, to, to God's ways, to God's will, then it is being talked about repentance. repentance. Uh, on, uh, the, the Lord Jesus, I think, said, Woe to you, to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bixida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. You see, now we can see a little bit of the, uh, the uh, reaction when we repent. They would, recognizing and giving the value of, of the understanding what it was wrong, they would tear their, their clothes, they would use clothes that are not uh, comfortable, that are not beautiful, that are not nice, like meaning I deserve a punishment for this wrong that I did. And uh, on Jonah, when, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 11, making a reference to Jonah's, Jonah's preaching where the people repented. So it talks about the repentance of the Nineveh, 
you remember Nineveh, that, uh, that uh, the Lord sent Jonah there. Jonah didn't want to go, ended up in the stomach of a whale, and then came back out and then went preach to Nineveh. And Nineveh, what did Nineveh do? They repented. They declared a time of repentance, a, a, a time to return back to God. So, as at this point, we can see that repentance is not simply a feeling. Although it can start as a feeling, it is not repentance until the other factors that imply a change in the values and purposes of a person occur. Yeah, when the change occurs, well then, uh, it might be a complete repentance. And even more, your behavior needs to change. In today's text, Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And here comes another word. And it's the, the word baptism, right? The word baptism. And um, Peter said, repent and be baptized. So when you have the feeling, the understanding of your wrongdoing, and when you uh, are sad because you don't, you didn't, now you would like that, that never happened. Still, you need to move to the next step. You need to change. Change is necessary. Change is necessary. And uh, at the moment of an encounter with God and talking about coming from the darkness to the light and coming to an encounter in the, in the kingdom of God with God, repentance was, was the next. I got to preach to my grandchildren. <laughs> and... Uh, Baptism, it is a call for the visible expression of repentance. And baptism, you know, all the baptism means is to submerge, to immerse somebody implies submersion. Uh, and, and, but for them, baptism was when somebody said, I don't want to follow my own ways, and I decided to follow God's ways. I, I let aside my interest and the purpose I had to embrace God's purpose, to embrace God's ways of living. So baptism is that public confession of my change. So you cannot repent. I'm sorry. You cannot repent and be of the secret service. You understand what I mean? You repent. You might start with the feeling of, of the emotion of, this, uh, of, of caught to the heart, like it says, but you have to uh, go to the point of uh, hating the wrongdoing that you did and moving on to change to a new life. And that's what is going to come up here in baptism. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, as, as Paul this, uh, has a, um, some words about baptism, he says that we were therefore buried with him, with Christ, through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So baptism tells us that when we repent, it's like we die. In the same way that Christ expired on the cross and was, uh, his body was taken to a tomb, we die. 
When we go into the waters, we're buried with Christ. That's what we mean. That's what we confess. That's what we tell the world. And then when we come up, in the same way that Jesus rose from the dead, we are raised, but we are resurrected to a new life. Is change, change, change. Change. We must place great emphasis on the phrase, let us walk in a new life. When you have an encounter with God, change occurs. There's need to be change. The very reality of the encounter leads us to uh, this change in every way. I mean, we talked last week about Isaiah in the presence of God. And Isaiah was a prophet. You know, Isaiah was not a sinner that, you know, uh, this day he heard for the first time the gospel and he, no, no, Isaiah. Uh, but he, has, he had his relationship with God. God talked to him before and all. But when he was in this place, in the very presence of God, he was completed, completely, uh, um, uh, how can you say, in a, unable to do anything. He was completely invalid. Just because he was in the very presence of God. And we need to understand that when we have an encounter with God, we lose control. And I, and I don't mean that you get crazy, you start throwing stones to the people. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean is that you are not anymore on charge. God is on charge. I say I couldn't do anything. But let, let, let's go to a more simple example. The woman that was caught in the adultery, in the act of adultery, was taken to Jesus and, and she was accused by those and they were ready to throw stone on her. On her and he said, okay, uh, everybody who is free of sin uh, threw the first stone and uh, everybody disappeared. And so Jesus looked at the woman and said, where are the people that accuse you? And she says, they, they're, they're gone. And then Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and live your life of sin. You see, that's the part that many people don't pay attention. They like to come to church. They like to, to, to pray. I mean, they like to come to the altar and that somebody put your hands and, and uh, somebody give them a word or whatever to feel a little uh, emotional or whatever. They like it. And uh, the problem is that they get out of here back to their own lives. But Jesus said to the woman, go now and live your life of sin. I'm not going to accuse you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to sentence you. Go, but you need to change. You need to change. Uh, Zacchaeus, that we know, this guy that went to a tree and, uh, because he couldn't see Jesus and the multitude let him, let, didn't let him pass. G Zacchaeus... When he saw himself seated at the table with the master, his life changed. And he said to the Lord, look, Lord. I mean, he became a child. You know, that's the way that uh, uh, Everett would call to me. Look, Abel, this and that, this and that. I did this, right? I'm uh, very excited. Well, Zacchaeus did that. He went to Jesus. Look, Lord, here. And now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Change. Change. When we have an encounter with God, there needs to be change. Paul. Oh, Paul, the big guy. You know, the, 
the, the, the smart guy, these, the guy with uh, a formation studied, a guy with relationship with influence in the government, a guy of success according to society, he had an encounter with Jesus. And the first thing he has, to, he had to bite uh, uh, the dust of the ground. But the transformation was so significant that at the end of the days, or as of Paul life progress, he came to the moment to say, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I died, says Paul. I died. There is a process, there is a lot of things that happen. But the thing is, you have an encounter with God, you change. You need to change. Change needs to happen. You know, if, if we look at, the, at the, uh, the gospel, we need to understand that to be involved in the kingdom, you need a mind of transformation. We need to change a mind of transformation. When, when um, Jesus and John the Baptist were preaching, they said, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. There needs to be change. There are details. I mean, John even said to some people, you have to share, so give, it to, give one to one that doesn't have any. But there needs to be change when we have an encounter with God. Actually, Jesus told uh, Nicodemus, one of the teachers of, uh, of the law there, you have to be born again. And when he explained what it was to be born again, the main thing out of it was that the wind, you don't see the wind, the work of the Spirit in somebody's life is like the wind, that you don't see it, but you see the effect of the wind on things. So Jesus is saying your spiritual, new spiritual reality, reality has to change your life out on the eyes of people. And uh, 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 Paul talking about, uh, uh, talking in, in, in the, uh, Romans chapter 8 about what is that God does without, he says that he's already predetermined that once we know God, we are predestined to be changed to the image of his son. Everybody that comes to the Lord has a predestination to be changed according to the image of Christ. Change is a must. It's part of the game. And uh, you, you find then a Paul saying uh, to the Ephesians to put off your old self and to put on the new self. So change, my beloved. Change is part of an encounter with God. You cannot come to God the way I came, you know, like a, I am a good guy, I'm a decent guy, so God, I'm giving you such a good gift, giving you myself, so now you use me because I'm, you know, a good, a good buy that you did. And the first thing that God gave, had to tell me was, listen, the first thing I have to do with you to use you is kill you is kill you, it's cleans, uh, I need to clean you, I need to change you. And the plan from eternity is that everybody should change to become um, like Christ, to be conformed to the image of his son. So, and in an encounter with God, we need a mind of transformation. That is the environment. And I'm just giving you a few, few, few things, few expressions. And when you go through the scriptures, you find at every moment things one after the other. But a final topic that needs to be spoken about 
when you talk about an encounter with God and the change that God has to do is the Holy Spirit. We cannot wave to talk about the Holy Spirit. The text of Acts chapter 2 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In an encounter with God, God cannot be absent. In an encounter with God, there's no encounter with God if God's not there. Do you understand what I mean? It sounds kind of stupid or childish, like so simple that you shouldn't be saying that. Well, the experience tells me, yes, they need to hear that. In an encounter with God, God cannot be absent. The key of everything in an encounter with God is God himself. It doesn't matter the baptism, it doesn't matter the techniques of uh, spirituality or whatever we do. If God is not there, there's no, um, there's no encounter with God. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and John, Jesus already had said this to the, to the apostles. On John chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, he said to the disciples as he talked to them about uh, that, that he was going to leave, he says, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. <clears throat> you see, Jesus came. Jesus left. He went back to heaven. But he said, it is, it is better for you that I go back to heaven because then the counselor will come to you. In another way, in another words, the, lim the physical limitation he had for those days as a man would not impact anymore the relationship between a man and God. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And we know, we know. I mean, there's many things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit that it is important that we remember. It is important that we focus on. It is important that we stop on the way and stop living just pushed by my fears, pushed by my traumas, and pushed by the craziness of the world. We are supposed to uh, be guided by the Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Uh, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. We get so wrapped up by sin that we cannot even figure where we are. And we need the Holy Spirit even to give us a little push, give us a little light. So we can figure, oh my goodness, I am a slave of sin. <laughs> when he spoke about other part of the role of the Holy Spirit and to the Galatians chapter, on chapter 5, he said that the, the result of the work of the Spirit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Spirit is the guarantee that we have for the change. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we are just making human efforts that won't take, you, won't take us too, too far. That's why Paul prayed that out of his glorious riches, God may threaten you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. 
An encounter with God implies change, but change would not happen without God's blessing, without God's resources, without God's work. When the Lord Jesus launched them into the world with the preaching of the gospel, he told them, I know you have learned some lessons. I know that uh, you have chased demons out of people and you have seen the healings and all of that, but wait in Jerusalem until I give you myself, until the counselor comes until the Holy Spirit is poured out, so that they would have the ability and power to fulfill the new responsibility. When we have an encounter with God, we are never alone. We are never alone. His Spirit accompanies us and enables us to make the changes we have to make and thus walk in a new life. So, as a summary, in an encounter with God, there must be change. No one who meets God can remain the same. And in that encounter with God, we see the work and the power of the Holy Spirit who guides us, equips us, and trains us for the new life. An encounter with God implies change. Are we changing? Are we changing? Or I just inserted in my life a new group of people, a new set of songs, and uh, a few new places to visit uh, in my weekly agenda. No, we need to change. The path of the righteous is like when the sun rises, that is every time ever brighter until the day becomes perfect. So remember, enjoy your experience of an encounter with God. But remember that you're going to be changing day by day. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. We pray that you give us that power. We pray that we understand and that we don't hold on to the old stuff the worldly stuff and the confusion of the past and the traumas that have uh, affected us for so long. And that we can walk in newness of life by the power of the Spirit, following the compass of your will in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Hallelujah.